Good afternoon, everyone. On behalf of the Physics Society, I welcome you all to the 23rd Bogley Memorial Lecture Series. These lecture series are held every year in the memory of our distinguished physics professor, Dr. Rajendra Kumar Bogle. This year, we are extremely delighted to have Professor Joseph Samuel from Brahman Research Institute, Amitsas. Professor Samuel has worked in several areas of theoretical physics, such as general relativity, classical mechanics of constraint systems, classical and quantum optics, statistical mechanics of soft matter, and quantum information. His research has the unifying theme of differential geometry and topology in physics. He also has an interest in popularization of science. Sir retired from Raman Research Institute as a professor in 2017. After retirement, he is currently associated with RRI, RRI as the Professor Emeritus. Sir, we extend a warm welcome to you and thank you for accepting our invitation to be the speaker for the event. I now I now request our entity. Dr. Jacob Jarian, to please come and say a few words to inaugurate you. Once again, we are together to remember Dr. Popley, and we are especially grateful to Professor Joseph Sandian to have. And I can't but uh, help, though actually Sanjay would be talking about Dr. Popley. But I can't help about remembering Dr. Popley. We both used to share that room together and he used to try to train me in having a diet. He was a man who was a teetotaler, who, was, who had no bad habits of any form. And I was just remember, reminded of a very small incident. I used to visit his home often because I was uh, young and I joined as an adult teacher. And I was a remember of a very small incident which, which tells you perhaps about more about Dr. Popley than anything else. So one day what happened is, you know, I tried to make tea at home and I'm not all that good in tea at home and I managed to drop boiling hot water in my hand. And we had been friends for a, more than a year, one and a half years, and we had you know, gotten along. Well, Dr. Popley was an excellent homeopath. He, all of us used to love, he used to give medicine, he used to carry medicines with him. And you know, sometimes physicists do things reflex with reflex. So when this boiling water fell, I just touched like this, and the whole skin came off. So it was very painful, it was very uncomfortable. So what to do, I called him from my home, Dr. Popley. I managed to do this careless act. I managed to peel off my skin, and he said, don't worry, I'm going to get medicines for you. So fine. So next day morning, I said, I can't come. And there was a silence in his voice. I asked him, Dr. Popley, are you okay? And he said, yes, I am okay. Jacob, I'll tell you later, but I've got your medicines, I'm sending you it in science. So two days later, I came to the college and his medicines did apply to me. And then I realized when I reached the college that two hours before he got the medicines for me, he had got the diagnosis that he had got cancer and had just a few months to live. And I was absolutely awed that a man who just when you heard that he had cancer, could still think of getting homeopathic medicine for a friend. I did go to we meet him many times after that. But that was Dr. Popley for you. Always there for anybody who needed help. Always able to reach out. And we all remember him, we all remember him very fondly. And I remember Dr. Popley very fondly. And uh, we are indeed very, very happy to emulate him and to remember once again the good people that our life was made up of. So once again, thank you all for coming. As we remember once again, the great man called Topi, whose picture is here. And uh, we remember him very, very fondly, all of our students, teachers, across the board. If you were to call a lot of people who, were, who wanted to leave physics, the way he encouraged them, he touched their hearts, and he was there for everybody. So once again, thank you all. And we remember once again Dr. Popley and his family and for all the blessing that he was. Thank you.
Sanjay Kumar. Please come and share his memories about Dr. Gopi with us. I'd like to mention before I forget, Professor Muthu is here. He was Dr. Gopi's colleague. Maybe you got appointed around the same time? Yeah, Professor. almost. Sure. He has taught in the department for many, many years, then he moved to the University of Delhi. In fact, just now we are requesting him to come and speak about Dr. Kokri because he spent you know, the time with him. But anyway, I am here now. Uh, Shall we give a hand to Dr. Kokri? <coughs> <Matu? Yeah>. Yes. <laughs> uh, it's very difficult to, you know, uh, tell the younger audience here about somebody, a person who was teaching here in this room maybe five decades ago. You know, so almost two generations. And things have changed a lot in our country in the intervening period. So it's difficult to communicate the sense of the person. Uh, but I'll try. Uh, he taught us mechanics first year. And at that time, the annual scheme. Uh, I remember he would always come in Kurta uh, In his picture, I think this was taken much later. You can see him in shirts, etc. But I remember very distinctly in first year, he always wore Kurta In the winter, he would might, you know. Um, put on some jacket, etc. And this was a college uh, which at that time was very westernized. That proper English, you know, you have the right accent and things like that. And there was this person who is just dressed like an ordinary Indian. And uh, in fact, you can look at the, some of the older pictures of the older faculty, you know, pictures taken in the 1970s. Uh, everybody is dressed, you know, coat, tie, Proper picture. Even Dr. Popri is dressed like that in the picture. But when he came to a class, it was a different uh, person as, as it is. Uh, so, culturally, you know, how to place a person like that who was, was extremely good physicist, uh, had his fundamentals on tips, but would walk like, dress like a very, very ordinary Indian person. That I think is difficult to communicate the sense. Now, I remember in our class, there, you know, there are always certain some smart Alex who think they're too smart, who can outsmart the teachers. <laughs> uh, but in Dr. Pogli's class, even though he would speak very softly, you know, ever you would hear him raise his voice, but there would be pin drop silence. It was as if you know, a person looks very ordinary in one sense. Other people could not take him to be ordinary. He was in some sense, his presence was exuded that kind of extraordinary presence, which made you know, uh, such people also you know, hold their whatever tricks they wanted to play or something else in check. About his teaching, uh, he's one of the very few people I have met who could just discuss physics and talk physics. See, you would have seen in physics teachers, you know, all, our hands are always, you know, in chalk dust because you write too much on the blackboard all the time. I remember he would very rarely, maybe only five or six times in a class, he will lecture, he will get up, write an equation, then come and sit on his chair and speak about the equation, you know, bring out all its different aspects, talk about it and draw us in about so many different topics. So that was his, you know, uh, kind of method of teaching. Okay. He could just talk physics rather than, you know, use uh, the help of other aids to uh, discuss physics. Uh, I think his death was uh, very painful. I was not around, you know, when... Uh, it was not painful. Yeah. Sedatives were given. Yes. Okay. I mean, that's... But physically, that when you know that, you know, you're going to go in a few months, uh, things become very hard on you. On you were very brave on your friends, everybody, okay. Uh, many colleagues, Dr. Muthu is here, Dr. Bhargav, who also passed away, I think, two years, again, due to cancer. Uh, so many of his colleagues, the department, the college, everybody, you know, pitched in whatever way they could. Uh, but after, I think it was a shock for everybody, in some sense. Because around 20 years he spent in college, uh, all the 20 batches would have gone through him, and his colleagues, they felt especially attached to this person. And uh, so after his death, it was mainly Dr. Bhagav's initiative, you know, who was very close with him, that it was thought, okay, uh, let's do something in his memory, which will be permanent, you know, and continue. 
And in some sense, if not the legacy, because things have changed quite a lot. Our methods of teaching has changed a lot, for instance, syllabus has changed a lot. But, ne but the nevertheless, a kind of institutional memory of a remarkable person should come. So that you know, batches you know, who are coming in future at least go back uh, aware of you know, something about Dr. Bokhi. So with that objective, this lecture series was started. It may have been one of the first lecture series in our college, which is you know, every year we invite the noted uh, physicists to come and present uh, an area of physics in a domain which students can access. So that was, you know, what happened after Dr. Bobby left us. And I think that's it. Uh, uh, earlier, you know, his wife also used to come to every lecture series. I think she's, uh, she's also she's going over. She's moving to Bangalore. Okay. She's moving yeah, to Bangalore. Uh, but you know, Dr. Bobby certainly was a person who seems to repeat his quotes to his colleagues. Uh, you know, everybody remembers him extremely fondly, and uh, the way he left us, you know, I think everybody felt very, very sad. So here we are for the 23rd edition of this lecture series. I'm sure that everybody would enjoy. Thank you. Thank you so much. We will now begin with the lecture series on gravity and decongruence. I request everyone to please switch off their mobile phones. Today's lecture will be a lightning introduction to the theory of relativity. We'll begin with special theory of relativity, uh, with using exper thought experiments involving clocks and mirrors. Next, uh, Sir will be moving on to general theory of relativity, where again the physical contents will be discussed using thought experiments. I request Sir, please come. And thank you. for this invitation and St. Stephen's College for their hospitality. I want to thank uh, the students who have been so hospitable to me, Shayan and Aditya, Priyanka, Vatsala, and uh, uh, Shauda, and all these people have made my stay more pleasant. I've been having chats with them over about many different kinds of things. Uh, I'm very happy to be here and to try to share my excitement with the subject of physics with all of you. So I will be talking about this topic, gravity and decoordinates. And uh, you will see that I want to present things in a slightly unorthodox kind of way. You might have learned the same subject in your class. Yeah. Come on. And of course, your teachers would introduce it differently because they have more lectures, but I'm going to do it from a slightly different point of view. And uh, you might enjoy seeing a different perspective, which is what I think Sangeeta intended when she invited me here for this lecture. <coughs> so I'm going to talk about gravitation and quantum theory, and in particular the relation between these two theories. Now both these theories are something that you're all very familiar with, so when I drop this piece of chalk like this, it falls and it hits the floor, or it hits the table. Now, it falls because of gravity. You all know about gravity. And it hits the table, and it stops because of quantum mechanics. The fact is that the chalk has atoms in it, and atoms interact with other atoms, and the correct description of atoms is quantum mechanics. And the reason it stops and doesn't go all the way through is that there are fermions here, and fermions cannot occupy the same state as you probably learned. There are also cooler repulsions. All of that is best described by quantum mechanics. Now, quantum mechanics describes atoms, molecules, solids, cold liquids, and it's also there in your mobile phones. All of you have a mobile phone in your pocket, and the transistors work because of quantum mechanics. It's a very well-tested theory, and similarly, yeah, uh, 
Uh, it's a very well-tested theory, and it's the reason why you people can get on Facebook and interface and do all those things that you normally do, when you should probably be studying. <laughs> <laughs> now, this theory and its relativistic counterpart, which is called quantum field theory, of which quantum electrodynamics is an example, is one of the most successful descriptions of elementary particles. <coughs> In fact, QED has predictions that come from theory that are stretched out to 12 decimal places. And whenever the experimenters improve their accuracy, which is now at nine decimal places, they find that QED is vindicated every time. So this is definitely a very successful description of elementary particles and fields. However, there are problems with this theory. Many of these problems may be in our heads. There are problems with interpretation. So it may be a problem rather than the problem of the theory. The problem of infinities in quantum field theory is one of the problems that they have. And the emergence of the classical world is something that we've not understood yet. The classical world of planets going around the sun is quite different from the quantum world of electrons going around the nucleus. And we don't really understand the connection between these things. So it would be good to have a better understanding of quantum physics for these reasons. Not for the mismatch with the experiment of which there is none, but for, yeah, okay. I've said enough about quantum mechanics. And about gravity, this theory is best described by Jeffrey Ellsworth. It's a theory put forward by Einstein, whose birthday is tomorrow. This gives an excellent description of gravity on scales from the Earth to the universe. It talks about the solar, well, there are tests of the theory of the solar system. There are predictions of black holes, gravitational radiation, and the universe, the cosmology itself. The trouble with this theory is that while it's very successful experimentally, it predicts its own demise. It tells you that as beyond a certain point, I will not work anymore. It's an honest theory from that point of view, in a sense that quantum mechanics is not. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> because there are theorems in general relativity which tell you that eventually there will be singularities and the theory will break down. So there are relations. I mean, we would like to understand both these theories more fundamentally. <coughs> Now there's a considerable body of truth in both these things, quantum mechanics and in general relativity. But there's also considerable tension between the two theories. We don't understand the tension that forms. We don't understand how these two theories are going to fit together. And this is the subject of current research. A lot of people all over the world work on this topic. Now, to quote Shakespeare, let us not to the marriage of two theories and with impediments. He didn't quite say this, he was talking about love rather than truth. <laughs> so I'm going to give three lectures, graded in level, starting with elements, that's today, and ending with current research. And I hope this will make some kind of inspiration for you to study these topics and perhaps get excited about it. So I had actually earlier fixed it to be First talk about special and general relativity. Relativity in general in the first lecture, and this topic second and the last lecture is with, as research. But after consulting Sangeet, I decided that I should be slightly more gradual in my ascent. That's what you will hear today. So I'll spend the first lecture only on the special theory of relativity. The second lecture on general relativity with a little bit of the radiation part. And finally get to the topic of my interest, which is gravity and deep of course, I want to clarify that questions are most welcome. I would like to be interactive. That's to say, I want you to ask the questions, and so I know what you're thinking. I don't mind if I don't get to the end. Please feel free to ask questions, especially when I say something that's not uh, clear. Yeah, another reason for questions is that you give me a chance to drink some water. <laughs> In physics, we deal with motion, force, energy. We like to describe planets and atoms, the whole world that we see around us. And you should think of all this as a play. You get, the motion happens in space and time, and space and time give us the arena or the stage in which the drama happens. So before understanding the play, we need to understand the stage, which is space and time. And that's what the theory of relativity is about. So we need to understand empty space-time before we put anything on to space-time. Yeah? So when we get to the end, in fact, 
it will turn out that gender relativity in the stage itself is part of the play. That's the ultimate message of gender relativity. If you get nothing else out of these talks, that should be the take home message. That you cannot separate the play from the stage. The stage is space time. But for the moment, we'll ignore the fact of the space. The space time is going to join the stage, the actors on the stage. We'll talk about empty space time. Now, relativity is generally considered to be difficult by students of approximately your age, but it's really not so difficult. It's actually much easier than quantum mechanics. Many of you have no trouble with quantum mechanics. You solve all the problems from shift or, or, or land on which is whatever you're used to. But it actually is much harder than relativity. I'd like to persuade you that relativity is easy, and that's what I'm spending the first two lectures on. Quantum mechanics will give you headaches if you really try to understand it. And I think you all know that uh, St. Stephen is the god, is the patron saint of headaches. If you have a headache, you should pray to St. Stephen to get it your <laughs> The main message of this part of the talk is that space and time are love. Now that might look like a paradox to you, but for a start, they've got different dimensions. The first thing you look at in physics is dimensions. You can't add apples and oranges. And space and time have different dimensions. One is measured in centimeters using things like this rulers. And the other is mentioned uh, is measured in by clocks using something like this. And these two have different dimensions. How can they possibly be the same? Well, no, the answer to that is that there is a fundamental constant in nature, namely the speed of light. We call it the speed of light, but it's much more than that. It's actually a fundamental constant. It's also the speed of neutrinos, it's also the speed of gravitational waves. So let's forget about the other things, we just call it the speed of light, because light is more familiar to us than the other things. So the fact that the speed of light is, has got the dimensions of a velocity removes this problem of, the light, of space and time having different dimensions. So in future, we will not distinguish between space and time, but we will divide the space by the speed of light to get a time. So we measure distances in seconds. For example, Pluto is one light day away from me. That's about 10 to 5 seconds. And the Earth is one seventh of a light second in its circumference. So we convert everything into time units. I will use only clocks. And the best clocks around are atomic clocks, they're tiny little things, which have a beat, a regular, uh, a very fixed kind of a beat. They tick at a certain rate, just as your heart beats. An atom has got a clock. An atom supplies you a clock, which has got a very definite frequency. And clocks are much simpler objects than rulers. So, just to be dramatic, I'm going to take these two rulers and I would like to throw them out of the window, but I won't have that. You don't have a window to throw them. So no rulers, we only use clocks. The reason for this will return to at the end of the end of this talk. So I had earlier planned to talk about both special and general entity, but today it's only special. So let's pitch right into it. So first we'll start with empty space time. Remove all matter. Now, the trouble is if you remove all matter, you can't do any experiments. So we'll make a bit of a compromise on that. We'll, of course, keep some light. We'll have the liberty to send light signals up and down in space. Of course, we have to be there. We'll be observers. But we don't want to distort the space time too much. So we won't, uh, well, we'll go on a diet and make sure that we don't have too much of a gravitational field that will disturb space and time. That's us. And we'll also have clocks. Clocks are, of course, atoms, tiny little things that do not cause any disturbance. Now we'll use torches to shine light up and down and mirrors to reflect rays of light that are inside of them, specularly reflect them. We'll use clocks to measure the time and our brain, brains to reflect on what we found. So here's a picture of what I think space-time looks like. This is the time axis and that's the space axis. Notice that I've divided the space axis by C, the speed of light, which I think all of you know the speed of light. This, can someone tell me the speed of light? <laughs> Take the part of something, yeah. It's a large number, but actually it's a small number. If you look at cosmology, you realize that the speed of light is a small number. Because light takes forever to get here. The supernova that happened in 1987 
the light that came to us left the origin when, you know, 30,000 years ago, before recording history. Okay, so this is time and that is space. And I have a system of assigning coordinates to every point in space and time. So what is a point in space and time? We call it an event. An event is something which is localized both in space and time. And a good example of an event is a firecracker at Diwali. Now, I realize that this is an event that most of you don't like because it causes a lot of pollution in Delhi. But just take the abstract example. If some, when a firecracker goes off, it's like that. It's a snap of a finger. It's localized in space. It's here rather than there. And it's also localized in time. It's a very quick kind of thing. So it's really impossible to define an event fundamentally, just as it's impossible to defi define a point in geometry fundamentally. But we'll take it as defined. That's a point. Now I want to find out what coordinates have been assigned to this point. I send up a light signal from here at a certain time T1A, according to my clock. I'm A, by the way. And it goes at 45 degrees on this diagram, because light travels always at the same speed, which is C. It goes to the point of interest, and is bounced back by a mirror and received that T2A. So it's clear that light takes as long to get there as it does to come back. So the difference of the two times of sending and receiving divided by two should be xa over c. That's the di distance away from me, measured in units of the speed of light. Or that's the time away from me. And of course, light goes there the same speed as it comes back. So the average of these two times is the time coordinate for that event. So I'll define x, a, and t, a as the coordinates of that event. Is that clear? This is a very sensible way of assigning coordinates to points. Now, consider two observers. One guy is A, the other guy is B. And in general, B is moving relative to A with some speed. We'll find out about the speed later. Now, just as A sends a signal from here and gets it back, B does the same thing. Now, the only trouble is that A's times and B's times are measured differently. B has his own clock and he measures T1, B, and T2B. And he will assign his own coordinates to it, which is the average of the two times being the time coordinate there, and the difference of the two times divided by two being the spatial coordinate. So what we're trying to do now first is to set up a dictionary between the coordinates assigned by A and the coordinates assigned by B. Now, first thing to understand now is the Doppler effect. If you have light emitted from here, suppose you have a sequence of pulses emitted from here. Each of them will arrive at B's world line at a different event. So B will measure a different time along this world line. Now you're not familiar with the Doppler effect. It happens quite often when you have uh, an ambulance or something, when it overtakes you, the pit changes as it crosses. And this effect is appreciable, well, that's the effect, Doppler effect in sound. A very similar effect happens for light. I can't do the Doppler effect for light because I can't move at a speed which is close to the speed of light. But if I could, for example, if I were to take a red chalk and move towards you at half the speed of light, it would look blue, it would look like this. And if I move the blue chalk away from you at half the speed of light, it would look red. Yeah? So the frequency changes. And frequency is no different from a clock. Time intervals between the crests of the wave are the clock. So I'll show you a demonstration of the Doppler effect with the sound rather than light. So Delta appearing between 
in the, in the opposite sex. So when you put these two together, yeah, before that, suppose you had uh, three observers. This is A, and this is B, and this is C. So if you have a Doppler shift between A and B, so that effect is got by, suppose you're sending light rays from here to there. Then the Doppler shift from A to B and the Doppler shift from B to C, that together is the Doppler shift from A to C. Because light rays are just going through B and coming here. So this is the proper property of the Doppler shift, which is multiplicative. That is to say, A times B, A B times B C is equal to A C. So it's a good idea to take logarithms which write delta as equal to e to the power of alpha where alpha is a quantity which is related to the speed. If the speed is zero, there is no Doppler effect. And as the speed increases, the Doppler shift keeps on increasing. So I think all of you are familiar with exponentials and cosines and shines and things like that. So when you do that, you, you write down the equation that I told you, which is just that the times are stretched according to the Doppler effect. You find that Tb is related to Ta and XA by these simple formulae. And this is called the Lorentz transformation. Yeah. All I did was to collect the terms corresponding to TA and XA. Is it working? Yeah, the battery is all right. Oh, I see. This is contact. Yeah. So the relation between the coordinates assigned to the same event by these two observers has got cosine, shine, shine, and cosine here. And you also notice if I look at the combination u times v, that is the same. u times v is just t squared minus x squared. And that's the same whether you look at observer A or the observer B. So the quantity s squared, which is t squared minus x squared over c squared, that is the same between the two observers. And now let's work out the, the velocity of these observers. The lines of the light rays stay the same. But on the other hand, there's a strange effect because of the, the, the Lorentz transformation. If I look at uh, if I look at things from A's point of view, two times where two events which are not separated in time have got T A equal to zero. But then this from B's point of view, they are separated in time by this much. So the notion of simultaneity is relative. Just because one person says two events happen at the same time doesn't mean that everybody will agree on that. So the vanishing of TA does not mean the vanishing of TB unless XA is equal to zero. That's one of the effects that you see from the Lorentz transformation. Another effect is time dilation. If you look at this equation, the times of A and the times of B are related by this factor of cosine of alpha. So time appears to be stretched for a moving observer. <coughs> of course, the moving observer will think that the other guy's time is stretched. And finally, we have this formula for velocity addition. If you have got three observers, as I did here, we know that alpha is an additive quantity. And the velocity is given by tan hyperbolic of alpha. Now if you just use an elementary formula for the addition of tan hyperbolic, tan hyperbolic of a plus b is equal to tan hyperbolic of a plus tan hyperbolic of b divided by 1 minus tan hyperbolic of a times tan hyperbolic of b. You get the relativistic velocity addition formula. That drops out of the Lorentz transform. And another consequence of uh, the Lorentz transformation is that energy has got mass. That is, in other words, E equal to MC squared. This is a cartoon drawn by, by my daughter, who is about nine years old at the time. So it's possible to derive this equation, E equals MC squared, from 
from advanced concepts. For example, you can use classical mechanics and write down Lagrangians and derive this equation. But I'm going to present a simple thought experiment to get at this effect. Yeah, by the way, does anybody have uh, an app on the mobile that causes uh, a, a fixed frequency? Like a it's working. <laughs> So I want you to consider a box in which this is a black box which is very light. Okay. But can you get that sound to there's a frequency also. It's not the same as the time as measured along this curve. So time depends on the path that you follow. Now this is already familiar to us when we talk about uh, distances. If I want to get from, let's say, Bangalore to Delhi, I can, of course, take the shortest path, which will be the shortest distance. But I can take another path and come there. That will be somewhat longer in, in time. But a similar thing is true for I'll take a longer path that will have a larger distance between the two points. Now, however, when I go from P1 to P2, if I take this path, I'll have a certain time interval between, if I have a clock that ticks along this path, my clock will have a smaller reading than if I take this path. How do I know that it's smaller? Well, if I take an extreme case of going at the speed of light like this and like this, I know that this path has got zero distance because it's moving at the speed of light. And also this has got zero distance. So I can get there with zero distance. And of course, a part which is close to that will also have a very small distance, or rather a very small time. So zero time to get from P1 to P2 by following the null curves, and a finite time to get there like this. So the strange thing is that if you have two twins who are born at the same time, and one of them stays where he is, and the other travels and comes back, when they meet, the twin who has traveled will appear to be younger. Because after all, we all have clocks in our bodies. Our heartbeats are clocks, and the cells in our body divide. So there's a biological clock. And that is also affected by motion. So special relativity tells you that time is, a, is not an absolute thing. That is the same for everybody. And in Newtonian physics, we have a time that is, everyone will agree on what, is the, what, what the time is. And in special relativity, nobody will agree. And the surprising thing is that the straight lines are the longest time between their endpoints, as I was saying over here. Maybe I should pause for questions in case there are any about this. Longest or shortest? Longest. Longest time. Straight. Yeah, right. More time. Uh, does it produce a drone uh, sound? Okay, I hope this is uh, audible and I hope I won't destroy your phone. <laughs> Everyone can hear this. And I also hope that I won't uh, enjoy it.
Can you see the frequency changing? Is it changing? Yeah. What's the mean frequency? Is it 440? Sorry? It's 440. Yes, yeah, changing, right? Yeah. So one might think that if I don't use this instrument, you might think it's a psychological effect that you think it's changing, but this shows that it's actually is changing. to derive all the consequences of special relativity from just simple arguments when you said light signals from point to point. Now, where does that get us? There is a difference between space-time geometry, which is Nikolaus scale, and Euclidean geometry. Now, you all know the theorem of Pythagoras. I just take this thing almost very familiar to you. So if you were playing, paying attention in your geometry class, you know that if you have a right angle triangle, the side which is opposite the right angle is called the hippopotamus. I'm sure you all know this. <laughs> so you also know that the hypotenuse has the property that it's the sum of the two squares. So this side is A and this side is B. The hypotenuse, the square of the hypotenuse is equal to the sum of the squares of the hypotenuse. Now when you get to space time, you draw the same diagram and you find something even funnier. This is time and this is space. The length of this side is equal to the difference of the two squares. So this is a new kind of geometry. Oh, sorry. Squared minus the square. This is a new kind of geometry, and that is called Minkowski geometry. So Euclidean geometry was based upon ideas of uh, well, of the Greeks and all that. They were able to set down a consistent system of axioms that will let you derive all of geometry from just a few axioms. So there's a connection between geometry and mechanics. In other words, when we talk about space-time, straight lines correspond to uniform motion. And just as in ordinary geometry, the length of a curve depends on the curve. It doesn't just depend on the endpoints. Similarly, in special relativity, time is a path function. It just doesn't depend on the final and initial points of the curve. It depends on the entire curve that you follow. And in fact, it's the longest time. It's the longest possible distance between the endpoints. A straight line has the longest distance between the endpoints. And there are things that you can prove. For example, if you take lines which are parallel, you can extrapolate them as much as you like. They will never be. <coughs> and this is true in Euclidean geometry. You can ask about corresponding results in Minkowski geometry. And many of them are true. But what is not true is a consequence of the fact that this minus sign is different from that plus sign. For example, there are curves of zero length here. I can take a curve which is called as much t and s, and its length is equal to zero. Light travels at the speed of light, which is along the path which takes no time. Maybe you explain the question and I'll think about it. Like, can it be, can we visualize it, uh, can it be embedded in an Euclidean geometry? Sorry, can it be? Embedded in an Euclidean geometry. No, no, it cannot. Because there are no, see, in Euclidean geometry, if two points have zero separation, they are the same point. In, in higher because, dimension, in higher dimension. Even in higher dimensions, a similar thing is true. If two points, suppose you take any Euclidean geometry, any in a number of directions. Two points which have zero separation are the same. Whereas in Minkowski geometry, you can find two points which have zero separation and which are not the same. So it does not be much. Yeah. It's a different geometry. We have to get used to it. Yeah, I, I forgot to... I 
forgot to touch this thing. We just get the stock time of account. So one of the consequences of the Lorentz transformation is the Lorentz contraction. You can go back and see that Yeah, if you, okay, never mind that. Suppose you take a ruler, here's the ruler. And if you go to a moving frame of reference, it will look like this has got a shorter length than what it actually does. So these two, if this ruler is in my frame and this ruler is moving past, I will think that the other ruler has got a shorter length. Okay? So there are limericks made about this, which I'm sure you know. There is a, there was a young man named Fisk whose fencing was extremely brisk, exceedingly brisk. So swift was his action that the fixed contraction reduced his rapier to a disc. That's <laughs> so legs look different in different ways. It's the forefront of physics today to understand how well we can measure time. That is actually an interesting point which we would like to discuss. But for the moment, it's enough to say that certainly clocks are better than rulers. We don't, because we know that rulers, for example, you take these two rulers, and they're supposed to be the same. But if I heat one of them, it's going to expand. And then they won't be the same anymore, even in the same thing. I can make sure that they're at the same temperature, and so regard them as standard, which is what we do all over the world. But then if they're in relative motion, you're not, this, you're not sure that they're the same anymore. In fact, one is shorter than the other. And the trouble comes because the two ends of the ruler are at different points of space. And we know that two points at different points of space may be at different parts of time in a moving frame. Relativity of simultaneity causes the two ends to be at different times. So you're not sure what you're really measuring when you use rulers. That's why I like to give up rulers and stick to clocks. So let's take the Lorentz transformation. I think I'll write it out here again. And look at how well it fares when we go to an imaginary universe where the speed of light is not constant but infinite. I told you that the speed of light is very large by everyday standards and very slow by cosmic standards. Yes? Actually, the earlier that statement in, the, uh, in that geometry, in geometry, yes. the distance between two points, even if it is zero, that is two points, that doesn't make sense. Yeah, you, you're saying that if the distance between two points is zero, it should be the same point. That's true in Euclidean geometry, but this is a set new kind of geometry where that is no longer true. Four dimensions. It's a, uh, yeah, actually I'm only working, just to make things easy, I'm saying to two dimensions. If the two dimensions are both spatial, we have ordinary geometry, but if I take one of the dimensions time and the other one space, then I have a new kind of geometry, which is what the theory of relativity is about. So in the new kind of geometry, there are points which are separated by zero. There are two points, you can find two points which have zero distance between them, or zero time between them, but they're, really, they're not the same point. So you just have to accept this. That's, that's the advance which is there in relativity. Sir, can you please tell what exactly causes the length to contract when it moves to a yeah, actually, it's, it's it's only an apparent effect. If you look at if you look at what a ruler really does, so if I take my frame of reference and I've got a ruler, this is the length of my ruler, let's say 30 centimeters, and it's always 30 centimeters. This entire space, this is x by c, and this is t. So this should be 30 centimeters divided by the speed of light or something like that. So a ruler is not really a world line, it's traversing a world sheet. This whole thing is a sheet. It's a two-dimensional space. And when I measure the distance between these two points, I'm measuring the distance at the same time. Now if I go to a different frame of reference, these two points would be at different times. I'd like to pick two points which are at the same time, and that might look like this. So this length could be different from this length. It looks longer. But in Minkowski geometry, it's actually short. So that is the Lorentz contraction. So 
So that's why I rejected rulers. I mean, many people reject rulers. For example, well, Kim, Kim, Kim Jong-un is not a great ruler like this. <laughs> so rulers are things that we should get rid of, eliminate from our system of politics. Let's use only from this. It's not an apparent fact, rather it's a real fact which takes place when we travel at the speed of light. Yeah, when you travel at a speech which is comparable to the speed of light, it actually happens. So bad contracts. No, but any velocity it happens. At any velocity it happens, but the effect is not noticeable at small velocities. So let me now explain the boundary characteristic limit. So Let's go back to the Lorentz transformation. He said that T A is equal to cosh alpha B minus sine alpha X and uh, X A over C is equal to or was it B and no, B? No. Maybe I should just say copy it from my So I'm going to use the notation C is equal to cosh alpha, although it looks like the speed of light, and SI is equal to sin alpha, just to save writing. So TB is equal to TA cosh alpha minus XA over C sin alpha, and XB over C is equal to minus XA over C sin alpha. transformation as we derived it by sending light signals up and down. Now let's suppose we live in a universe where the speed of light is very, very large. It's actually true. Most of the time in our everyday life, the speed of light is so large that we don't worry about it. If I say I'll meet you at 8 o'clock, I can, we can all agree about 8 o'clock to a high degree of accuracy. But suppose the speed of light goes to infinity, then it's evident that this term goes to zero. So Tb is equal to Ca and when Second time it is T, uh, T A C O by C. Uh, T A C O. The second line. Second line? T A is just T A C O. So, yes. so now uh, you remember that tan alpha was equal to V over C. If C goes to infinity, you can replace tan alpha by alpha itself. Tan hyperbolic alpha is very close to alpha. And cosh alpha is very close to 1. These are identities that you get from trigonometry. For example, sin alpha is practically equal to alpha itself. Similarly, tan alpha is also equal to B by C. And cosh alpha is practically 1. So if you take these equations and take the limit of C going to infinity, you find that Tb is equal to Ta, in other words, all the times agree. Our, our times will agree, even if we are in relative motion. And secondly, you find that Xb over C is given by x from here, and this is 1. But you find that it's equal to x minus Bt. Because uh, this thing is sine alpha, so I can take this equation and write Xa over C, and cos alpha is 1. And minus here, I find that Shine is the same as tan hyperbolic alpha times T A. And this is exactly what is the velocity. Okay. So we recover the non-relativistic rules of transformation of the labels of points. This is the non-relativistic limit. Now let's think of a let's think of a picture. <coughs> of space-time that looks like this. So normally we plot C, T versus X divided by C. But I'm going to take the C out and do it the old-fashioned way, plot T axis on this axis and X on this axis. If I look at this, these are the paths that light follows. And this is called the light cone in physics. 
The light cone, because if you were in three dimensions, it would look like a cone. So if I'm sitting at this point here, Yeah, if I was sitting at this point, all this is the future, all this is the past, and all these points here are neither future nor past. We call them air squares. So this is the future, this is the set of all events which you can influence. And this is the past, this is the set of all events which can influence you. And these points, you cannot really influence them. They might influence you later, but they cannot influence you at this time. Now, if C goes to infinity, what happens is that these cones get scratched down like this. And so it becomes as if you have an instant. So that's the non-relativistic limit. Now, it's very important to understand that when relativity comes, it's not that Newtonian physics is out of the window. It's true that for certain purposes it's out of the window. But most of the time, you can get by with Newtonian physics, and it's good as an approximation to the world. So it's not that relativity disproves Newton, it just improves Newton. So it's always the case that when we have a new theory, the old theory had some truth, which is also valid in a certain regime. All we've done is to come up with a theory that works in the larger regime. So to summarize, relativity alters our notions of space and time. All of Newtonian mechanics had to be rewritten to suit these new notions. It turns out quite surprisingly that electrodynamics, which was discovered experimentally around the same time, it does not have to change at all. In fact, electrodynamics predicts that light is electromagnetic radiation, and the equations of Maxwell actually tell you that light goes at the same speed, no matter which plane you're in. So electrodynamics was already compatible with the special theory of relativity, and the constancy of the speed of light was already built into Maxwell's equations. So this is a theory that did not have to undergo any changes at all. What about quantum theory? <coughs> well, quantum theory which was originally developed was non-relativistic. We wrote equations that were wave equations that use the non-relativistic ideas. And this had to be rewritten to accommodate special relativity. Now what happened when you did this is that there was a problem. Because we learned that E equals mc squared. And if you had two particles, which collide at a speed which is comparable to the speed of light. The kinetic energy in those, new, in those particles is similar to the rest mass energy. Because if B is high, if B is high enough, if B is of the order of the speed of light, the kinetic energy, which you can think of as half mv squared for a star, this can become as large as the rest mass itself. So that means you can have particles being created. Okay. So once you have particles being created, the theory that you have started with becomes invalid because it deals with the fixed number of particles. The theory that has a variable number of particles is called quantum field theory. And when you create no, more particles, you can also create them in pairs. So you can create, for example, an electron and an anti-electron. This theory actually predicts antiparticles. And this is one of the most successful theories of particles and fields, quantum field theory. So we finally end up with predictions which we did not think of when we started out. For example, when we started out trying to revise ideas about space and time, we ended up with a new prediction that for every particle there's an antiparticle. And in fact, the electron has an anti-electron, which is called the positron, which has actually been seen a particle with the same mass and opposite charge as the electron. So there's no conflict between quantum mechanics and special relativity. The conflict is only with the theory of general relativity, of which we will speak later. So I think I've got about five minutes to go, finished on time. So I'll stop here and take questions for the rest of us. So let's take that question and answer it in the context of, uh, of 
you can do job actually. So suppose there is between two parts there is a straight line and a curved line. So it's obvious here in the Euclidean cortex. This I'm talking about ordinary geometry. This line is shorter than that line. There's no symmetry between them. Because this is a straight line, that's a curved line. Similarly, even in the case of the two twins, there's no symmetry between the two. One guy is staying in an inertial plane, he's moving without forces, the other guy is moving with acceleration. That breaks the symmetry between the two. And the white guy who's moving with acceleration is actually aging less. So if you want to stay young, travel. <laughs> So what I was saying was that the, the geometry of Euclid is entirely different from the geometry of Minkowski. Yeah. So I want to look at this diagram. So this is a light ray. So it's got a length of zero. This got a length of zero. And this has got some finite time. So I've made a triangle where the two sides have got length zero and the third side has got a finite distance. So you can see here that this is actually the longest distance between the two points. And uh, this has actually got zero distance. So normally in Euclidean geometry, you take the two sides of the triangle. Their sum is more than the third side if they form a triangle. That's not true here. The sum of these two is less than that. So this is something you just have to get used to. It's a new kind of geometry which differs from Euclidean geometry by one sigma minus sign. And that also means that what you thought of as rotations, which were described by trigonometric functions like cosine and sine, are now described by imaginary rotations which have cosine and shine. So mathematically it's a very simple thing. You're just rotating through an imaginary angle. But physically it's very hard to grasp. That's the trouble that you're having. So you just have to get used to it. This is the way the world is. And not the way you were taught in your geometry classes. The geometry classes were okay for space. But this way talking about space time. And space time actually has a different structure from space. There's, there's a difference between space and time, and that difference is only in these kinds of things. There are minus signs which are relatively big spaces. So, the, so yeah. the, uh, let's say if I am in body, same, uh, I have my own frame of reference, uh, and in my in my frame of reference, I observe that a particle is being subjected to a force. Yes. Then is there an, in another inertia frame, inertia frame I'm talking about, yes. will that force be modified? Yeah, you're asking for the special electricity transformation of force. It will be, mo it modified. Will be modified. But then, uh, but if the force is non zero, then in every inertia frame it will be non zero. Yes, very good. It, That's good. Yeah. So zero force translates to zero force, force because zero, zero force means straight lines, and straight lines go to straight lines under a lot of transformation. But non-zero force translates to a different non-zero force. But, but can, uh, there will be no inertia frame in where a non-zero zero. You're absolutely right. And what is actually an antiparticle? Like for, uh, for an electron, I can visualize a positron to have same mass but different charge. What other properties make of something anti? Of yes, actually everything is, the mass is the same, but the charge is the opposite, if it has a charge. There are some, some particles which are their own antiparticles, like photons are their own antiparticles. So you can create photons in pairs. Just like if you can create electron. See, there's no conservation law preventing you from creating new particles in pairs. But when you come to charge, a charged particle cannot be created in you cannot create two electrons because you violate charge conservation. So, what, so are, the what are the properties? It, it has every property what? identical apart from the charge. So, for example, I can have an anti hydrogen atom. I can take an anti proton and an anti electron, we put them together, they form an anti hydrogen atom. And it has exactly the same spectrum as the hydrogen atom. So, antiparticles are an important prediction of special relativity. This was done by a gentleman called Dirac. If there's time, I tell you a funny story. Okay, so just a charged particle, any particle will be same in all respects except for its charge. Except for its charge, yes. Sir, is it possible? Yeah, I, I just really, I think, I was here for a while, I just moved. Uh, 